does a award ceremony. Uh, it's a little bit different with no dancing, uh, at least not too much dancing compared to our usual award ceremony at the, uh, at the, at the dinner each year. Uh, Sally, our executive officer, has just asked me to tell everyone we're, we're going to record this uh, award ceremony. If you don't want to be recorded, just uh, turn off your camera, please. Welcome uh, to our 2020 TARSA Awards. I'm Dan Woodman, the president of TARSA, uh, at least for a couple more hours before I'll hand over to a new president at the AGM. Uh, this is a year, I think, when uh, we've needed awards and to celebrate some wins Darling. more than ever before. So it's very exciting that we're, we're able to do this. Uh, we, have, we have quite a few awards this year, so we'll get straight into it. Started. So I have the, the, the pleasure of introducing the winner of the first award uh, and the panel or the selection committee for this award was the full TARSA executive. Uh, so, so the winner of this award is, is one of our most accomplished sociologists in Australia, I think, without doubt. Uh, she was the founding director of the Tasmanian Institute of Law Enforcement Studies. So this person was really the leader in the professionalisation of policing in Australia, and as well as a, a, a stellar academic record in publications and impact. Uh, I, I think one of the, the greatest signs of impact is the number of previous students who are out there in the world. And this person has 35 HDR students either finished or in the process at the moment, and has also uh, represented uh, the University of Tasmania on the school's board of Tasmania as well. So help to get social science into the school's curriculum. Uh, and most importantly, the final thing I want to say about our winner before I introduce them is uh, that they were the president of TARSA as well between 2005 and 2006. So without further ado, the winner of the Distinguished Service to Australian Sociology Prize, Professor Roberta Julian, over to you. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, and hello, everybody. Uh, just to let you know that I'm, I'm saying hello today from um, Nipaluna, Litra Wita, which is uh, what, Hobart in Tasmania. Um, and I'd like to just begin by acknowledging the custodians of the land that I live on and I work on, the Muanina people, um, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Um, I'm feeling very honoured and quite nervous actually about receiving this award. It's always um, a, a big honour to receive award from your peers and your colleagues, I think is um, some very humbling experience. So thank you first to the TARSA committee for the award, um, to my colleagues who nominated me. Um, I can't mention them all, there are a few, but I, I would like to mention Peter Cook who initially approached me and um, persuaded me to agree. <laughs> Um, it's not something that um, I necessarily would have thought of, of putting myself up for. Um, so service to Australian sociology, I think, is, is an overwhelming thing to, to sort of receive. I don't really believe I've done much more than most other people do who are passionate about sociology. And I think most of us are like that. Sociology is not a job. It's not a career. It's a worldview. It's a way of life. Um, it's something we live and breathe and just continue to, to work on. So... Um, um, I, I just uh, acknowledge that we're all, in a sense, doing the, the same kind of work. Just want to make a couple of points in the couple of minutes I've got. Um, and one is that I, I just, you know, part of, it, part of this is, is just I've been around for a long time. Um, and reflecting on, on when I started, I, I was in the first cohort of sociology students to enrol in sociology at the University of Tasmania in 1977. Um, and fortunate really because of that, as many, I see some familiar faces there, I'm looking at Pam at the moment, um, we were really part of that kind of wave of sociology in the 70s and 80s that took over um, at a time when it was really, really vibrant, it was really needed, it was a worldview that was quite challenging and radical. Um, it was a time when the, the Vietnam, Vietnam War had finished a couple of years earlier, um, refugees started coming from, from Vietnam and Cambodia. Um, the sort of children of post-war immigrants had grown up to adulthood, university was free. Uh, we had a whole lot of mature age women around us. It was a really exciting period to be engaged in sociology um, and it captured a lot of our imagination. 
So for me, doing research and teaching in multiculturalism and ethnic identity, which is where my passion began, um, it was just perfect timing really to, to commit to, to a lifetime of, of that kind of research. So I've been lucky that that for me, I just I love teaching. I've I've taught lots and lots of first year um, sociology students and others, um, bringing sociology to year eleven and twelve to Tasmanian schools was a really um, important um, piece of of she teaching sociology to police recruits at the T Tasmania Police Academy is also, again, exciting, rewarding, and and really challenging. Um, so just a couple of points I'd make in terms of my the highlights of my career, certainly being appointed as the Foundation Director of the Tasmanian Institute of Law Enforcement Studies has been um, a huge part of, of my career. Um, being able to teach police as they kind of open up to the world outside. Um, and um, my specialist field in that is, is really around forensic science and how it's used in criminal justice. Um, and I mentioned that because there are two areas that there's not a lot of sociologists working in, in policing or in, in forensic, what we call forensic studies now. Um, and it's really open um, for young sociology students and particularly those of us who, who do qualitative research. It's, it's begging for ethnographers to go and have a look at how police do policing, how forensic scientists actually do forensic science. Um, so I'd, um, I'd sprout, um, spruik that, that as, as something that, that is growing. The other thing, as Dan mentioned, was being president of TASA. Um, very, very important to see how the association, association works and how important the association, I think, has been to sociology in Australia. So I would like to mention the people, the people that were with me on that. Um, I thought I turned the phone off, sorry. One, four, five, zero, one, two, one. Oh dear, Zoom, Zoom meetings. I can't turn it off. Oh, I can mute it. Um, I'd like to thank the people that were that supported me um, as TASA president in particular, John Germoff, um, Zlatko Scribus, Eileen Clark, uh, Tara Ooh. McGee and Sally Daly was there supporting us then as well. Um, so just finishing off, so personally, I'd just like to say that really, I think sociology has given me a life uh, much more than I've given it. Um, I've had the privilege of meeting all kinds of people from diverse backgrounds, which I think is what sociology does for us or enables us to do. Um, and those people have, have opened up my eyes. They've helped me challenge my taken for granted world um, and um, hopefully help me grow as a person um, throughout my career. I've had a few people who've supported me on that journey right from the beginning um, and at the risk of offending lots of people who've, who've really been part of my career, I would like to mention a few who, um, who are TASA members or have been um, and have been particularly important. Um, firstly, Sharon roach Anlu. Um, Sharon and I were first year students in sociology together um, first lot of honours students at UTAS, there were five of us at that time, and Sharon's been a, a, a strong supporter of my, my research for a long time. Um, Rachira ganguly uh Catherine Robinson, um, who was a student of mine and continues to support me, uh, and Rob White, who's been really crucial in my, the latter part of my career. So thank you. I really, really appreciate this. I'm very honoured um, and uh, thank the committee and all the people who have supported me throughout my career. Thank you. Thank you, Roberta. Congratulations. Thanks, I love man. that idea that sociology is more than a degree or even something you do, but a worldview and maybe even a, you know, a way of life. And, and someone else I'll introduce now who's lived that sociological way of life, I would say absolutely, is Professor Pam Nyland, who also very kindly agreed to, uh, to chair our selection panel for the Stephen Crook Memorial Award, named after another former president of, of TASA. So over to you, Pam, for a couple of minutes to introduce our winner. Um, okay, so it was a great uh, privilege and pleasure for me to chair the Stephen Crook uh, Memorial Prize, which is a book award, and um, I take pleasure in it, partly because I think when we look back at um, 
Stephen Crook, he was a past TASA president, a joint editor of the Journal of Sociology, Foundation Professor of Sociology at James Cook University. Now, he was very concerned with political sociology, but also with social theory and the sociology of culture. So I'm pleased to point out that the 2020 winning book in this award provides exemplary scholarship in social theory and actually reports on research findings in the field of sociology of culture. However, of course, it does much more. The winning book in 2020 is Nicholas Hookway, Everyday Moralities, Doing It Ourselves in an Age of Uncertainty, published by Rutledge. Now, can I say that the committee had a really hard time judging a winner because this was a very strong field of entries on this occasion. I've sat on the committee before. All the books offered something innovative and intriguing. And in fact, three or four books came right down to the line. However, the one by Nicholas Hookway, Everyday Moralities, impressed the judges. It asks how we as late modern people construct morality in a context of moral uncertainty. The early chapters in the book deal with the theoretical background, including a really engaging critical discussion of Durkheim. The empirical examples in the later chapters are love and intimacy on the one hand and also human animal relations, how humans treat animals. The book employs, I'm a methodology freak, so I love the fact that the book employs the innovative methodology of online diaries and blogs. And it really spells out the complex and intriguing ways that people today narrate and experience everyday moral decision making. Now, Nicholas Hoque shows how DIY morality functions in late modernity. In, in the view of the committee, the book makes an incisive and generous contribution to Australian sociology and to the sociology field worldwide. And at this stage, I would like to throw to Nicholas, if you would. Are you there, Nicholas? Certainly am, Pamela. Okay, I'm going to sign off now and let you have a few. Thanks so much. Thanks, thanks, Pamela, for your uh, for your kind words. And I'm still waiting for this to be a, a mistake. And uh, so it's quite, uh, yeah, it's quite, uh, overwhelming and I guess it goes without saying that it's a it's, it's a special honor and uh, one that I'm, I'm really humbled by and certainly thought would never happen so and as as Roberta said to be honored by your peers is is something really really special um, it's also special to be awarded a, a prize established to honor the memory of um, Professor Stephen Cook um, I'm based at UTAS and um, as Pamela just pointed out, uh, Stephen was at UTAS uh, for 12 years where he was a head of sociology and social, social work uh, and where he made uh, a significant contribution to, to sociology, to public debate, um, to TARSA, of course, and was known as a, a warm and generous uh, colleague and, uh, and teacher. So very briefly, I'd just like to thank the following people who have who have contributed to, to making um, of, of the book. Um, firstly, to my UTAS colleagues, particularly to Daphne Habibus and Doug Ezzi, um, <laughs> wonderful there it is, uh, for, for, for believing in me and being such kind and generous guides. Um, they've really helped shape the book and the ideas and they've taught me much about what it means to be a sociologist as well, I think. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Sarah James, who uh, we spent some time as co-conveners of the, the Cultural Sociology Thematic Group. And uh, I remember complaining to Sarah about how I was trying to get my book published and I was doing cold calls to publishers and they were like, go away, uh, we're only publishing textbooks. Uh, so it was a huge relief uh, and with great excitement when Sarah told me that Professor Keith Tester was, uh, who was a kind of an, a bit of an intellectual hero of mine, uh, was editing a series uh, called Morality, Culture and Society. And then she was gonna make the connection, um, which she did. And I'll always remember that email from Keith, uh, where not only did he say he was interested in publishing the book, but he also knew that I was a Hawthorne football uh, club supporter and uh, uh, mentioned how, how remarkable Jared Ruffin was as a, as a full four. So that was um, that was a really special moment in my career, one I always remember. So um, 
and look, thirdly, I'd, I'd like to, to thank my, my partner, Melody, who's endured the most uh, in writing of this book. And finally, I'd like to dedicate the book to and this, this award to, to the memory of Keith Tester. Keith sadly passed in 2019 and I'll always be indebted for the opportunity and support that he provided to, to write this book. And well, I miss his, his kindness, warmth and humanity and and certainly his intelligence. So um, thanks very much. Thank you so much, Pam, and congratulations, Nick. So it seems like a timely book as well. Our everyday moralities have been pushed and stretched and maybe remade this year, and I can't wait for your um, everyday Zoom moralities as a follow-up, but it sounds like an absolutely wonderful book. Thank you, Nicholas. So our next uh, prize is the Raywin Connell Prize, named after Raywin Connell, who really does need no introduction, but I'll introduce instead Associate Professor Lucy Nicholas, who very kindly agreed when I approached her to, to chair the panel for this award. So over to you, Lucy. Thank you, Dan. And again, I would like to, um, well, firstly, I'm on the Gadigal land. The land of the Gadigal people, the Yoruba nation here, never ceded, always was, always was, will be Aboriginal land. Um, and I would again like to echo, and I'm not just saying this, that this was an incredibly hard decision to make. We had a dream panel, but also a dream selection of books. It was super competitive. There were a lot of entries and it was very stressful, but also enjoyable. Um, so the winner of this year's award is, excuse me, I'm getting my drum roll ready. Stephen Threadgold's Youth, Class and Everyday Struggles as part of the Youth, Young Adulthood and Society series from Routledge. Um, this book was a joy to read. Um, it deals with, I guess, it problematizes kind of traditional ideas of, of class, especially in Australia. Um, and through looking at these case studies of the bogan and the hipster, um, it then goes on to look at the case study of DIY culture in a subculture in Australia, I guess. Um, so we have a really interesting use of Bourdieu, which I think really contributes by itself to the field of um, Bourdieuian studies. And then using that kind of framework, Steve goes on to look at hipsters and bogans and how they've been portrayed in media and comedy. And then um, onto this DIY cultures case study in part three. Best of all about this book is that it has mixtape for every section, so you get to discover new music as you go. Also opens with the C word in the introduction, which was just, I was hooked by that point, frankly. Um, but overall, the, the panel just sort of agreed that the book is balances accessibility and really engaging empiricism with without compromising theoretical complexity and without the, um, compromising kind of conceptual ambition. And that is not an easy feat. And your sheer mastery of the field came through, Steve. Um, you make an exceptional contribution to youth studies beyond the kind of established and some would say dated paradigms that are often used. And you really contribute to understandings about class in Australia in a complex way. The data was incredible um, and your take on Australian youth culture is super timely um, towards some incredible ideas. It was written so well and supported by the evidence masterfully. Um, I cannot recommend this book enough and we'll hand you over to Steve to say a few words. Uh, uh, thanks so much, Lucy. Um, yeah, I'm really kind of surprised and um, humbled to get this award and it's kind of yeah, I feel it's kind of absurd to have my name anywhere near Raywin Connells, who's such a, an amazing figure. So, um, yeah, I'll try and do it uh, this really quickly because I am, I don't want to be a hypocrite because I am one of the people at the dinner that's always like going hurry up so we can get through the awards so we can drink more. So, um, uh, firstly, I really want to thank Tarza, um, basically uh, just for existing. I mean, um, it's such a huge um, help, I think, to Australian sociologists. I remember, I think it was uh, Michael Gilding, the one that we hosted at Newcastle, was talking about how before he took over as president, he thought that Tarza was this kind of huge industry with lots of people doing all this work, and he realised very quickly that's about five people doing an incredible amount of work. So um, thanks so much for Tarza, and particularly to those on the panel. Um, it does seem like a luxury to be able to read like 10 or a dozen books or what it is, but I'm sure it didn't appear in anyone's workload or anything like that. So um, again, I really appreciate the work that's going on there. Um, 
the, the book's in a series that was created by Andy Furlong, who passed away, unfortunately, a couple of years ago, that um, is kind of a giant of the field of youth studies. So um, Andy was particularly uh, really helpful for me, for me um, in my early career. So I really want to acknowledge Andy's help over the years and, um, and um, um, point out how like influential he is in the field and um, what a really good person he was. Um, more personally, um, I got a, a lot of help with this book. So um, I got uh, feedback um, of a bunch of people that like really, every time I asked for help, I, I was um, getting um, advice that made the book better over the time that it was written. So in particular, I'd like to thank um, Greg Noble, David Farisha and Pam Nyland for reading all or if not most of the book for me in advance and um, helping me a lot. Particularly Dave Farisha was like, um, advised me to cut a bunch of stuff where I was just basically having opinions about things that weren't really part of the narrative book. Uh, Greg was particularly helpful um, in um, advising me to kind of, I suppose, push and, and go and go bigger kind of theoretically sometimes. And Pam, as always, you know, read the thing from start to finish and, um, you know, really helped me a great deal with the book specifically. I was also helped a lot by um, Andy Bennett, Matt Bunn, Megan Sharp, and Dan Woodman, who all read a chapter or two for me um, uh, throughout the process. Really also want to thank Greg Noble, Anita Harris, Alan France, and Andy Bennett for writing such generous blurbs for the book. Um, and I would particularly want to point out Anita Harris as being someone that's been a real role model, um, I think, for how to be an academic. And um, conceptually, her work has been quite influential on mine, even though we're kind of working in very different fields, I suppose, in many ways. Um, and lastly, uh, the main person I want to thank for the book is Pam Nyland, who was the previous um, head of the previous panel. Um, the book's dedicated to Pam. Um, she's been a huge influence in my life ever since being an undergrad all the way through to postgrad and, um, you know, becoming an academic, something I never thought was even a thing, let alone something that I would do. So um, it's been great over the years to um, go through a process of being Pam's undergrad student and then <coughs> part of me postgrad and then now a colleague and friend so thanks so much Pam for your help over the years thanks everyone congratulations Steve thank you Lucy and all the panel um and thank you everyone for for really sticking to time I was thinking I might have to get Steve's mixtape out on him at the end but it wasn't necessary but I you know I, I'm, I'm very excited to to track that down for some summer listening and uh, Ash, I noticed your comment, the dad jokes will keep coming, um, ap apologies, but my uh, term as president is almost over. So, so we'll have to, we'll have to uh, see what comes after that. So I'll now hand over to our um, editors of the Journal of Sociology. Oh, I'm really sorry, I have a special commendation to present. Oh, uh, sorry, Lucy. That is okay. Back to you. I'll be really, really fast, but we had such a hard time with this award that we decided to also make a special commendation. Um, so very quickly, I would like to say that we would really like to commend Christine Aquino on racism and resistance among the Filipino diaspora, everyday anti-racism in Australia. Not very, you can't really see it there, but we just loved this book for some of the same reasons that we loved Steve's, which were um, the balance of empiricism and theory, the beautiful way that the interviewees were dealt with um, and the, the data integrate into academic writing beautifully. Um, we just couldn't let this go without mentioning it. So Christine, Christine, congratulations. Congratulations, Christine. I can see you're with us as well. Would you like to, to say anything for a minute? No? No, okay, congratulations as well to you. Thank, and thank you, Lucy. Uh, so, so now I'll hand over to Associate Professor Kate Huppertz and as, uh, Associate Professor Steve Matthewman, who is Steve with us, yes, as well. Uh, over to you two for our Journal of Sociology Best Paper Award. Thank you, Dan. It's a, a great pleasure to be able to present the Best Paper Award. Not everything attached to, to the work of journals is fun, but this is, is one of the highlights of the year. And, and uh, we, we were uh, just found ourselves awash with talent and amazing articles and an embarrassment of riches, really. So it was great. Um, we, we decide the best paper annually. Uh, we take the December issue of the year before and the first three issues of this year. So that's nearly 70 articles in all. So it's a, a, a significant competition. Uh, we then subject everyone to a judging criteria, uh, judged by innovation, international appeal, 
methodolo methodological slash analytical rigor, theoretical approach, and then we finally ask people, was it outstanding? Um, we then get a short list, um, and then we do that all, all over again. So it was um, a very rigorous um, uh, system, if you like, uh, a tough competition. There could be only one winner, and I will hand over to my colleague Kate now to explain why it was Professor Joanna Kidman. Thanks, Steve. As uh, Steve said, the winner this year is Joanna Kidman's article, With a Decolonisation, Indigenous Scholars and the Problem of Inclusion in the Neoliberal University. Congratulations, Joanna. This, uh, we agree that this persuasively argued, sharply framed article analyses Indigenous academic labour in settler, settler colonial institutions and is a really timely contribution to the debate on equity and diversity in the neoliberal academy. So we're really proud to say that this brilliant special, uh, this brilliant article is in our special issue, our uh, Indigenous sociology special issue. And uh, it's available to download for free. Thank you to Sage for that. So please do take a look and uh, congratulations again, Joanna. Oh. Tēnei te mihi, tēnei te mihi, tēnei te mihi. Kia koutou ki ngā uh, kaitiaki o ngā whenua, he mihi nui ki ngā tangata whenua o Ahi Tereiria, he mihi aroha, he mihi maioha, tēnei kia koutou katoa. I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of all of the lands that we're meeting on today and to pay my respects to elders past and present. And I extend those greetings to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, who in New Zealand as Māori we refer to as Ngā Tangata Moi Moia, the people of the dreaming. My greetings to you, to your ancestors and to your future generations. Um, I really want to express my, my thanks and deep appreciation um, to Taza and the Journal of Sociology for this award. I feel it's a real honour um, and I feel incredibly privileged, so thank you uh, for that. Um, there have been a, a number of sociological studies of academia in recent years, but very few of them are about Indigenous scholars and our experiences of, of life in settling universities. So there's still very little that's known about how that kind of double helix of neoliberalism and settler colonialism affects Indigenous scholars and our everyday knowledge production um, practices. So my paper came from a, a study that I did with senior Māori academics in New Zealand. And it came at a time when quite a number of them were on the point of leaving academia. And that was mostly because universities can be bitterly difficult and painful places for Indigenous scholars and also for Indigenous scholarship. So for some scholars, it was just getting too hard. At the same time, the call to return to their ancestral homelands and do important work there as elders was weighing really heavily on them. So in order to transform the academy and to open it to the voices of, of Indigenous peoples, my argument is that the task for us all as scholars is to decolonize. And I think as sociologists, our task is to decolonize our intellectual labor and decolonize our discipline. And sociology in, in the Pacific and Oceania is um, in real need of a radical revisioning if it's ever going to come to terms with its settler origins. And I think that's a really big task. But wherever we begin that task, and I think however hard it is, and it is hard, I think those beginnings really matter. And that's something that we can all do as scholars. And we do it as an act of solidarity. We do it as an act of defiance. Um, and also we do it as an act of love for our disciplines. Thank you so much for this recognition. I feel incredibly honored and proud. I want to acknowledge those very small groups of indigenous sociologists everywhere. Um, there aren't a lot of us, but um, they have been just so supportive in my career um, as a Māori sociologist. Peace and good health to all of you in these uncertain times. Nga mihi nui, no reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Congratulations, Joanna. Um, it 
it's an amazing paper and to, to come out of the the process of of judging 70 is really quite something and it is also quite something to have gone through a panel choosing out of 70 uh, papers as well so thank you again to kate and steve as, as you pointed out it, it's a big job editing the journal and some of the work isn't so much fun telling people that their papers aren't getting up this time around but but some jobs are are much more worthwhile than others. So thank you for, for doing that for us. So the next award is our Sociology in Action Award. And it's back to me to, to announce the winner of this award, the panel of which was the Taza Executive again. So this is to acknowledge sociologists who are doing work to of public sociology, really, to take their sociology out and to work with the community to, to make a difference and, and the winner this year and I'll just I'll just give a hint uh, one person on the executive had to leave the room while we went through the nominations for this award uh, so that will give you a hint of maybe what's coming but this, this this person really has an exemplary track record of working in with and for the community uh, to improve the lives of, of older people uh, so Particularly, I want to acknowledge her work with the Clarence City Council. So she led the development of, of their age-friendly Clarence plan, which is, I think, halfway through, so still unfolding. And, and this person also kind of led the process of putting the plan into, into practice in many ways. She's also related to this work on the board of directors for the Council on the Aging in uh, Tasmania. And the the executive in making this decision really noted some of the amazingly creative and numerous creative uh, ways she would co-designed uh, uh, community engagements using photography and other art forms with the community to, to do the, this work on, on um, building a more inclusive uh, community for all ages in Tasmania. So without further ado, I'll announce that the winner of the 2020 Sociology in Action Award is uh, Dr. Peter Cook. Um, thank you very much, Dan. And um, big thank you to Taza for this recognition as well. Um, some of you here today will know how much Taza means to me. And um, so it's lovely to be recognized by your peers. Um, most of my engagement and translation work occurs in Lutawita, now known as Tasmania. So I would like to acknowledge the Mulwinina and Palawa peoples, the traditional custodians of this land on which I work and I live, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Community engagement and translation work is really only possible by having the right partners. And I acknowledge the numerous community groups, organisations and members that I have partnered with and worked with. I particularly want to wish to thank who Dan mentioned, which was the city of Clarence for their dedication towards being an age friendly city. And I also want to acknowledge the Council of the Aging Tasmania, who always do an unbelievable and incredible job, but particularly during COVID-19. Thank you to the community members who've attended the various events and exhibitions, um, to those who've invested their time and energy into the community projects that I've led, guided or advised on. I want to thank my partner as well, Tony, who, when he could, would help me out on weekends in setting up and taking down exhibitions, which are always a, a massive job. Um, and one of the projects I've had 24 exhibitions for, so it's no small feat. Um, and of course, I also thank Tony for his continuing love and his support. Now, most of my community engagement work implicitly or explicitly deals with ageism. So I need to say something about ageism. Unfortunately, it's something that will affect everybody who is fortunate enough to grow older. It's a form of discrimination that all of us here today have either faced or we will face. And when we're ageist, we discriminate not only against older people, but we discriminate against either our current selves or our future selves. And yet ageism remains socially accepted. For some reason, we don't take it as seriously as we do racism, sexism and ableism. And each of us are guilty of practicing ageism in some kind of way. So what can we do about it? Well, I think one of the first things that we can do about it is just being much more 
critically reflexive and aware about how we think and how we speak and how we act and how we think about older people in the ageing process. By changing how we think, the way we act and speak, we can really start to model the change that we want to see in our society. And of course, this is not necessarily easy. And it's not easy because it's socially acceptable to make fun of ageing. It's socially acceptable to make fun of older people. But we can challenge this by being proud of our own age, for example. When we deny our age, we deny our life events and our life experiences, and we suggest that somehow it's better to be a younger person than an older person. But I don't know about you, personally, I much prefer being 44 years old uh, with everything that's led me here. And all of that is lost in romantic visions of what it means to be 21 again and again and again. So through the skills, knowledges and toolkits that we have as sociologists, we can connect and collaborate with and for others and to create more inclusive and equitable communities. This is what we do as sociologists, it's what we can do and it's what we will continue to do. And so to get a political for a moment, I'd say another way of saying this is that we are job ready and we are doing the job. So thank you very much. Thank you, Taza. And um, I hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you and congratulations again, Peter. Uh, what is showing from Tasmania this year? Uh, Victoria and the mainland closes the border for one year and look what happens. It's, it's quite amazing. I think it's uh, maybe a call to action to the, to the rest of us mainlanders to uh, to, to get on with doing the good work and get our applications in for next year before we have to change the, I don't know, the, the T for the to Tasmania or something at the start of Tarza. But well done to all our uh, UTAS and all the winners so far. Uh, so now we're passing over to Ben Lohmeyer for our Early Career Best Paper Award. So Ben, over to you. Thanks, Dan. Uh, so I'm coming to you from Adelaide, which is on Ghana land. Uh, so the Early Career Researcher Best Paper Prize is for the most distinguished peer-reviewed article published in any journal uh, during the last three years. Uh, the prize recognises early career sociologist scholarship, especially within interdisciplinary teams, which is uh, relevant for this year's winner. So what I'll do is announce the winner and then tell you a little bit about the paper. Uh, so the winner of the 2020 ECR Prize is Dr. Adrian Ferrigia. Research Fellow at Australian Research Centre in Sex, Health and Society at La Trobe for the paper in which he was the lead author in the journal of, uh, sorry, the journal Sociology of Health and Illness titled Take Home Naloxone and the Politics of Care. Uh, the paper considers, as it states in the abstract, the actions of take home naloxone, which is a life-saving intervention available to non-medically trained people for administration to other people experiencing opioid overdose focusing on how care relationships shape its uses and effects. Employing insights from the science and technology studies, they suggest that, quote, the uses and effects of naloxone are co-produced with social relations, and therefore, this initiative affords multiple outcomes. We argue that these affordances are shaped by politics of care, and that these politics relate to uptake, end quote. In the, in the paper, they focus on two cases. Firstly, they consider a case of safe consumption, the term, terminally ill man. And secondly, the gentle technique developed by one consumer for assisting others. And the panel offered the following reflection uh, on Ferrugia et al's paper. So the paper provides a highly original and sophisticated sociological analysis that expertly uses theory to build a new understanding and approach to opioid drug use. Combining STS scholarship with the politics of care the article pushes the discipline forward by showing not only how health initiatives shape everyday practices, but also how substances themselves produce such subjects of care and morality. Using a case study approach that is both intimate and insightful, uh, Perugia develops an empathetic understanding of take home naloxone use that goes beyond notions of harm and misuse and highlights how opioids use is entwined, entwined with everyday relations of care, intimacy and ethical struggle. So congratulations to Adrian Ferrugia. Um, thanks, Ben. Um, just before I start, I'd just say, yeah, I, I live and primarily work on the lands of the Wurundjeri people, and I just want to acknowledge their elders past and present, and that sovereignty has never been ceded. Um, 
yeah, I was really uh, surprised and grateful uh, to receive this award. Um, uh, yeah, and just before I say anything about it, I just want to acknowledge it, it came from a, this research was done for a discovery project led by the CIs, uh, Suzanne Fraser, Robin Dwyer, Paul Dietz, and international uh, partner investigators, Joe Neal and John Strang. And um, uh, yeah, that's sort of a, a very interdisciplinary team. It includes kind of critical sociologists and anthropologists, as well as uh, epidemiologists and like clinical cl people working in clinical medicine. And they were very, um, you know, generous engaging with me and, um, you know, using Latour and science and technology studies things to, to, you know, approach these kinds of issues. I also just want to uh, especially acknowledge my colleague and friend, um, Renee Formiati, who we worked together on this research and um, we've been working together since we started our PhDs together uh, in 2013. And uh, she's made a great contribution to my work and thinking. And yeah, just especially acknowledge the influence of Suzanne Fraser, who's been my um, mentor now for quite a few years and um, really helped me along the way. Um, you know, this uh, work, you know, it's about opioid overdose and the loxone, which, you know, when when people, when you think, if you administer to someone who's having an overdose in enough time, you essentially save their life and you, you know, you return their breathing. So it's about, um, so in saying that, I just want to acknowledge also the basically people who consume opioids, the primary people who, who are taking up naloxone and using it to save lives. And they're doing this in um, really often really trying circumstances. They face a lot of stigma and discrimination and they're very rarely publicly acknowledged for the work that they do. And I just think it's really important to mention sort of peer organizations like Harm Reduction Victoria, um, who have really been pushing this initiative for a long time uh, without getting any kind of public acknowledgement. And um, in a lot of ways, they're sort of shouldering the burden, saving lives that um, are caused by the failings um, of the state. Um, uh, yeah, that's all, thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Um, it sounds like a wonderful paper and we're sticking with Ben. For, for our next award, which is our inaugural. So, so first time, a Postgraduate Impact and Engagement Award. So back to you, Ben. Cool, thank you, Dan. Uh, so yes, this is the inaugural Postgrad Impact and Engagement Award. Uh, this award came about as a result of the TASA Postgrad Subcommittee uh, wanting to recognize and encourage postgrad scholarship in sociology. And there is a history of awarding scholarships to postgrads to attend the annual conference, uh, TASA's annual conference. And originally these were kind of based on merit. However, they've recently moved, I think for, probably for the best towards supporting uh, access for those who uh, are based on need rather than merit. Um, the postgrad subcommittee wanted to reintroduce an award for postgrads based on merit uh, and have it as part of this suite of awards that, that TASA hands out rather than just something that happens on postgrad day. In addition to this, we want to move beyond the sort of narrow dominant metrics of scholarship that typically focus on things valued uh, within universities to something that recognizes a broader value of knowledge and skills possessed and produced uh, by postgrads. So as such, we created this award and drew on the Boyer model that emphasizes four forms of scholarship uh, that includes discovery, but equally values teaching, integration, and application. So postgrads could self-nominate this award, but we also encouraged nominations from students, um, supervisors, and their peers. Uh, we had a strong inaugural field of applicants, uh, so strong we couldn't choose just one winner, so we decided to settle on two instead. I'll announce the winners, uh, tell you a little bit about their work, and then I will come to each of them in turn uh, to, to talk a little bit about themselves. Um, so the winners of the inaugural Postgrad Impact and Engagement Award are Brittany Ralph and Osmond Chu. And so yeah, let me share a little bit about their work now. So Brittany is a second year PhD student at Monash University and was nominated by her supervisor, Steve Roberts. In addition to her PhD work, she has coordinated and been a lead lecturer and tutor for an undergraduate unit, Men, Masculinity and Society. Brittany's student evaluations testified to the quality of her teaching, receiving 4.88 out of a possible five for her personal teaching and overall unit score of 4.75, a record for this unit. Brittany also took a lead role on several large projects, including an evidence-based review underpinning a development of Vic Health's masculinity and health framework. Uh, and Men's Risky Drinking Research Project funded by Vic Health. 
these, these pro this project was shortlisted for the 2019 National Alcohol and Other Drugs Excellence Award and was the winner of the Victoria Wide Vic Health 2019 Health Promotion Awards Research into Action Prize. Uh, so the clear cross-sector impact and evidence knowledge transfer of Brittany's work is what impressed the judging panel in particular. So congratulations to Brittany. I'll speak briefly about Osmond's work and then I'll hand over for them. Uh, so Osmond is a Masters of Arts student at Macquarie University and was nominated by his supervisor, Ben Spires Butcher. Osmond initiated an anti-Asian racism, anti racism project in collaboration with the Asian Australian Alliance. Uh, the project used an online survey to document incidents of anti-Asian racism in Australia since the, two, since the COVID-19 pandemic began. Uh, prior to this project, there were some anecdotal reports, but no systematic tracking of incidents of anti-Asian racism. At the point of application, they had surveyed over 400 individuals who experienced a racist incident and published a preliminary report identifying trends and significant findings uh, of underreporting to police. The findings from the project received substantial media attention across TV, radio, and newspapers. The findings and policy recommendations have also been shared with police, Australian Human Rights Commission, state uh, anti-discrimination bodies, cultural community groups, and members of parliament. The wide reaching impact and responsiveness of Osmond's work in particular is what impressed the judging panel. So congratulations again uh, to Brittany and Osmond, and I'll first hand over to Brittany. Thank you. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging that the work I've done to achieve this award has been carried out on Wurundjeri country lands that were stolen by my ancestors and on which First Nations people are still fighting to dismantle colonial structures and policies. And I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, congratulations to Osman and thank you so much to the Taza Postgrad subcommittee for creating this award. Like many of my peers at the moment, I'm pretty worried about um, what the university sector will look like when I finish my PhD. So venturing out into a not-for-profit or a government job is definitely on the table. And having connections with external stakeholders and experience writing for different audiences will be really vital if I do end up taking that path. So it's really great, I think, um, and timely that as a community of sociologists, we're recognizing the value of external engagement during the PhD process uh, alongside things like publication and teaching. Um, it hasn't been easy juggling everything while I do a PhD and continuing to actually get my PhD done. Um, so this award really means a lot to me um, and is a really nice way to end what's been obviously a tough year. So thank you for that. Um, of course, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for my uh, supervision dream team, Stephen Roberts, Brady Robards and Carla Elliott. Your support and guidance is invaluable to me both personally and professionally. Um, and Steve in particular, I think this award is as much yours as it is mine. You've tossed me in the deep end many times across my candidature, but always with the utmost confidence in my abilities. As a result, I've got a pretty killer CV, but more importantly, I have infinitely more confidence in myself and my abilities than I had when I started honours with you back in 2017 and was pretty much a hot mess. Um, so thank you. And uh, to everyone else, I can't wait to see you all in Canberra next year, I think. If you can't find me, I will be the one making a complete fool of myself uh, on the dance floor once again. So thank you. <laughs> and Osmond, are you there? Can you have an opportunity to speak if you would like? Uh, yes. Uh, so firstly, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians whose lands we are all meeting on today. Um, and acknowledge any elders past, present and emerging. Um, so this land was never ceded and will always be Aboriginal land. Um, so I also like to you know, thank Taza. Um, I feel very humbled to receive um, this inaugural award along with Brittany, who I'd like to send my congratulations to as well. Um, I'd firstly like to just acknowledge a few people who's played a really big role in this. So firstly, my wife, Louisa, who's love and support. Um, has meant that I can do this kind of work. Erin um, Chu from the Asian Australian Alliance, who I collaborated with this on, and um, my supervisor, Ben Spears Butcher, who encouraged me to put my name forward um, for this award. Uh, so I guess, as we all know, um, 
this year has been unlike any year that um, we could ever have imagined in recent memory um, with COVID. And I think we all know that the impact of COVID, while it has affected all of us, its impact has been disproportionate. And I guess that's sort of what shaped the work that I've I've done um, as someone who is a Chinese Australian, um, but has really been concerned about the direction that I think the treatment of Asian Australians and Chinese Australians um, have received over the last year, um, particularly since this COVID pandemic has started. And particularly as it has combined with a worsening debate about Australia's relationship with China. And through that, we've sort of seen this combination of historic sort of Sinophobic narratives that go back to the 19th century, along with this fear about, um, you know, the rise of China and its implications for Australia. Uh, so what really inspired me to do this survey was this sense that there was a gap and it's a gap that's been acknowledged by the Race Discrimination Commissioner as well, that Australia doesn't really collect any comprehensive data on racism um, and combined with the fact that the vast majority of people don't report it. Um, the survey itself found that about 90% of people who reported, who, who participated in our survey did not report the incident of racism they experienced. Um, and at last count, I think we had over 600 people who had reported an incident. So hopefully um, this, the work that we've done has sort of started to shift the conversation because unfortunately, unless something can be measured, often it doesn't really matter. And when earlier in the year it was say, talked about in very anecdotal terms, it, it wasn't these concerns and issues around, you know, the everyday racism that many Chinese and Asian Australians experience weren't really taken seriously. But as we have been able to put out reports and, you know, talk to the media, it's clear that it has gotten far more public attention. Um, and finally, I thought I'd just also mention that we also don't see the work that we do as part of an isolated soul of silo. Um, we have been in touch with similar with other groups overseas that have been doing similar work. Um, a, a bunch of our work was actually inspired by some of the work that Asian American groups were doing um, in the States. Um, similar groups are doing things in the United Kingdom and also Canada, um, sort of addressing these concerns about racism targeted towards Asian diaspora groups. And hopefully in the new year, we're going to be releasing and doing some more work, um, doing a global comparison of these incidents. So to highlight that this isn't simply an issue in Australia, but there are some global trends um, that we have seen as a result um, of COVID. Um, but yes, but anyway, thanks again to Tasa and uh, you know, everyone for being here uh, this afternoon. Thank you, Osman, and congratulations to you and Brittany. And thank you again to Ben and, and thank you to your, to your supervisors for, for pushing you in the deep end as uh, Brittany put it, and, but also for nominating you both, well-deserved. I think we're seeing today the, the best of Tarza's intellectual contribution to understanding the world, but also the best of Tarza as a community. So, so thank you everyone who's, who's been part of this award selection process in one way or another, as well as all our award winners again. It, you know, it is a year for, for acknowledging this amazing work. Um, and on that note, I'm going to say I'm, I'm going to run off because I'm, I'm due for my next meeting and thank you all again and hope to see some of you either at uh, the President's Address coming up or at the AGM after that. But uh, thank you again and I can't wait to see some of you hopefully on the dance floor or off the dance floor in Canberra next year. Bye-bye.